Well, good morning, everybody. It's Family Sunday, so we're going to have some little kids in here this morning. It's a really neat time. I see some of you guys over there. Uh, we're going to be digging into the Word this morning, and it's, it's going to be neat. I'm, I'm excited to see what God does with us here this morning. So welcome. Those of you who are a little bit younger, some of you are not younger, but there are some younger people in here, and I want to welcome you guys for, uh, uh, to, to big church here at Valley View. We're going to have a, a fun time this morning. Uh, this morning, I've got a, a conversation I want to have with you guys. I want to talk to you uh, about, I want to talk to you guys about pain, but, but the way that God describes the way that we deal with pain is different than the way that the world does. I was thinking about things that, that I've been in pain with this week, and whenever I think about pain, my body jumps to basketball, and I'll explain that to you guys here now. Um, every major injury that I have in my life came from basketball. Like my, one thumb bends more than the other. This one doesn't bend. That's, that's basketball. Um, that's a simple thing, uh, but I've got a lot more than that. I've got shin splints that I've had from basketball. Both of my front teeth are dead. Um, some of you guys may have heard the story from that. It's a crazy story, and I was jogging home from a basketball game. I was jogging, so there's basketball there too. I've broken, both of my wrists have been broken. My ankle has been broken. Um, my knees are going bad. It's kind of a fun thing. Actually, there used to be this thing that would happen when I would jump and try to grab a rebound. I can't jump anymore, so it's not that big of a deal. But back when I would jump and try to grab a rebound, sometimes I would land like this, and like the, between the vertebrae and, and my shoulder blades would like compress, and my entire body would go numb. That's not supposed to happen. But I kept playing basketball because I didn't want to stop. Let's see, what else do I got going on here? Um, oh, yeah, uh, my... my my gluteus muscle on my left side is permanently in pain because of something I did in basketball. Kids, you can ask your parents about what the gluteus muscle is. That'll be fun. Um, <laughs> let's see here. I've got uh, a scar right underneath my beard right here from a time when um, I actually put my teeth through my lip all the way. I had to pull like the lip off when they went to shoot the, no the Novocaine in there or whatever it is to dull it, to stitch it back up. It just shot right into my mouth. That was fun. That was basketball. Um, let's see here. What else do I have? Oh, my favorite story, when I was 11 or 12, I was playing basketball with my brothers. The four of us all together were playing, a stepbrother and my, my two younger brothers. The four of us were playing basketball in Albuquerque at a school, and I, and I went up for a rebound, and my, my stepbrother's hand was like this, and I landed, and his fingernail went into my eyeball, all right? Kind of a painful thing, and uh, I, I sat like this, and, and I was, it hurt. It hurt pretty good, and then my stepbrother said, Whatever you do, don't look at your hand. <laughs> what do you do when somebody says, don't look at your hand? You pull your hand away. I pulled my hand away, and there's blood. The blood wasn't coming from my eyelid, and it wasn't coming from my eyebrow. It wasn't coming from my forehead. It was coming from my eyeball. Because actually, I had sliced my eyeball open playing basketball. Now, this is the cool part, right? Because you think to yourself, why would this guy keep doing this? It's one thing if I was like riding rodeo. Some of you guys have like these cool stories and injuries from riding a rodeo. Or, or you know, like it's amazing. George has injuries from like throwing tires and picking tires up. I don't have those. I've just got things that I chose to put myself into. And it's just because I have no coordination. When I think of pain, that's what I think of. But some of you guys have been in a lot worse pain than that and had nothing to do with physical things. Right? There, are, there are cuts deeper than the thigh bruises that I've gotten from basketball. There are deeper pains than, come, than those pains. There are pains that come because we live in this broken world. And I don't care if you're 5 years old or 95 years old, you've started to experience some of those things. You've experienced pain from somebody saying something to you that was just awful. From somebody saying something about you that was just awful. From, from loss or sickness or cancer, you've experienced pain that doesn't go away. And this last four weeks, we've been doing a sermon series called Soul Struggles. We've been talking about mental health and the struggles that go along with that and, and the biblical interpretation of those things. What I want to look at today is the why. There's this word uh, that goes around in Christian circles. It's a word called theodicy. T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y, if you want to look it up later. But it's basically the concept of if God is good, why do bad things happen? If God is good, why am I struggling? If God really loves us, if God really cares about us, why am I struggling? I, I can look at basketball and see why those things happened, 
But there are other parts of life that the answer is not easy. And sometimes the answer is not something that I'm even able to understand. But what I want to look at today is that. I want to look at the why. I want to look at the, the pain that cuts deep. And I want to look at the why in a really in a way that is different than we normally do. Normally when we look at why God is this happening, why is this happening to me, we, we look at it as I don't understand and I just don't want to deal with this anymore. But my hope is by the end of our time today, as we deal with this question, as we walk through this, we, we go from the question of why to the question of, of like to what end. To what end is this happening or what's the goal behind what is happening right here? And like I said, it doesn't matter if you're five years old or 85 years old. This journey is for all of us. So I want to ask you guys to turn in your Bibles. Turn in your Bibles to, to Romans chapter 5. We're actually going to be, if you don't have a Bible, you can grab one of these right here. They're in the seat in front of you. And we're going to be on page five, uh, 942. Um, and in Romans chapter 5, we're going we're gonna to look at a passage that is really important to me. Um, this passage, I can't believe I've never preached on this passage. This is one of my like, most important passages of my entire life. Um, but this passage right here was something that God put in front of me at a really low point in my life when I felt a lot of shame about where life had gone and, and the place that I was. And God, through that, showed this, and it's powerful. I, I hope you guys get to have some of what God did through me and the Holy Spirit in this uh, for you guys as well. So let's dig in. Romans chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of the Lord. All right, so, so Paul starts this off. This is a new section of Romans. Now, if you understand the book of Romans, Romans is basically our doctrine book of the Bible. It talks about why we believe what we believe, what it is that happens when we believe, what happens with, with suffering. And this is the part, Romans 5 is when Paul moves from what happens when, when we played, put our faith in Jesus, like Abraham had faith and it was credited to him as righteousness, to now what? I have faith, now what? And then now what is this? He says, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And through him we also have also obtained by, access by faith into this grace in which we stand we rejoice in the hope of the glory of the Lord. This now is going to be a vital thing that we need to understand if we're going to understand suffering. What Paul says right here is going to paint a picture that is going to talk about everything else we deal with. And if we don't understand God in this, we're not going to understand God in the rest of this. He says that we uh, have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of what Jesus has done, we have peace with God. Wow. Have you ever had somebody you didn't have peace with? Who, like, somebody who you knew wanted to be your enemy, or you knew you, did, you wanted to be that person's enemy, and there's they're just, I don't want to be connected with this person. What happens when that happens? If, it, let, let's say, uh, let's say you, you assume that that person is out to get you, and then if you're a kid, they get in front of you in the water fountain line. Well, this is personal. I know that that person did that on purpose, and I know that that person is out to get me. If, they, if you happen to be seeing somebody on the road, and, and they, they pull into a parking lot in front of you, and you keep driving, you realize that they're pulling off to the side because they don't want to be around me, and it, they're out to get me, and they're trying to make me look like an idiot, and you start to think about all these things, and, and they, they, they add up. Have you, any of you guys ever been there where, like, everything you assumed about somebody was the worst? That's what happens when you're an enemy of somebody. Paul says that we were enemies of God. In fact, the Bible talks about the, all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, not even one. That's Romans 3. All of us deliberately chose, and this is, uh, you can, you can argue, we can talk about this. I want to talk about this. If you want to meet together, I'd love to talk about this. But all of us, on our own, have deliberately chosen to know the direction that God wants us to go and gone a different direction made ourselves enemies of God. 
where God's righteous desire, God's good will for us, and this is Adam and Eve, this is all the way back in the garden, we are no different. We knew God's good will for us, the, the, the structure that God had for us, the life that God had for us, the life that God desired for us to have is not the life that we wanted. We knew God wanted us to have this, and we decided to do this. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about, I know that God doesn't want me to have this piece of candy because my mom said no, but I'm going to get it anyway. Or, much, much further along, I know that I shouldn't be cheating on my taxes, I know I shouldn't be cheating on my spouse, I know that I should not be um, carrying around this constant anger and grudge towards this person, but I don't care anymore. I know you want this for me, God, but I'm going to do this instead. That's the reality of the creation and what Paul says, and this is what's beautiful, and this is why this is going to matter for us as we go towards suffering. Jesus has made it so that instead of God looking at us and said, I know what you did and you deserve punishment and death. He says, I know what you did, but Jesus has already paid for it. And that's the word propitiation. Now, it's a big word, but it's basically the, the idea of the sacrifice that turned away wrath. The sacrifice that, that, that turned away the wrath that we deserve. And what we need to understand is that God is working from a place where he wants and is at peace with us. Because if we don't understand that, and we start talking about suffering, your assumption is that I am suffering right now because God is upset with me about that thing that I did when I was 17. And he is desiring to make me pay for that because he would love to just crush me and there's no way that I deserve good things. And you're absolutely right. I mean, all of us, none of us really deserve like awesome stuff all the time because we know that I was talking with a lady here last week who's like, look, if, if my life was put up on that screen, it would be the most shameful thing in the history of the world. But what Jesus did, and when we have our faith in him, I love that. If we, I put my faith in Jesus, the rock at which I stand. If I put my faith in him, he is faithful and just and his sacrifice means that I am made at peace with God. So when God is working, when there are struggles and hard things, you can understand that God is working from a place of peace instead of a place of war. Jesus died for you. And because of that, if you see verse 2, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of the Lord. We have access to the throne room, throne room of God. We have access to God as Father. We have access, if you are a believer in Jesus, this is, this is a message for people who are believers in Jesus, that you have been adopted into the family. You are a son with full rights and full privileges. And God says this. We have access and hope. So this is the foundation today that we get into as we get into theodicy, as we get into the question of why do bad things happen if God is good? Why are these things happening to me if God is good? He says, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of the Lord. Let's talk about rejoicing before we get into the core passage today. Rejoicing. What does that mean? Does that mean, yeah! It's football season again, guys. We're going to be watching football. Some of you guys here next week are going to be so fired up, all right? We're going to be showing up in jerseys here at Valley View. People are going to be, you're going to give up. I got, I got some of you guys like, yeah, and I got some of the other people in here some going, oh my word. <laughs> here we go again, right? <laughs> some of us are not into sportsy things, but there are going to be some of you guys who are on Sunday afternoons are just going to be like, yes, my Cowboys won or whatever it is that it is. Is that rejoicing? That's celebrating. But the Bible doesn't say we celebrate in the hope of the glory of the Lord. It says we rejoice. Rejoicing is built around the root word of joy. And joy is something deeper than simple happiness. Three weeks ago, four weeks ago now, um, I dropped off my oldest daughter at college again. And uh, we went to church Sunday morning and then... Uh, I had to drive back here to New Mexico from Kansas. Was gonna, we're not going to see her again until till, till 
uh, Thanksgiving, and that's, that's a long time when you're used to having kids around. And so I gave her a hug, and she's tall, so we got to hug together right here. And when I pulled away, I looked in her eyes, and she was crying. That hurt. But it wasn't a hurt that cut like, what is happening here? This is the worst thing ever. In fact, when I saw her face, inside my heart I rejoiced. Not because she was in pain, but because she is a grown woman who wants to take this on, knowing that this is going to be hard, but I'm taking responsibility for my own life, which means that when we set out with this little baby girl, I've got a picture in my office of holding this baby. I could not hold her right here now. <laughs> Our goal was not to raise a good kid. Our goal was to raise a godly woman. And as she pulled away, I saw a godly woman standing there who was strong enough to take this on herself. It hurts, but you can rejoice. Does that make sense? That's rejoicing. Because it's deeper than just the temporal thing that's happening right now. It's deeper because it lasts longer and it's built deep. And so when Paul says we rejoice in the hope of the glory of the Lord, that's the picture. That we are, we are in this place where something deep has happened and it's profound and I know that regardless of what's going on, there are good things happening. And then Paul says that, in verse 3 and 4, you guys ready? This is the passage that is going to kick our tails, our gluteuses. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the, the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul says we rejoice in the, holy, in the hope of the Lord, in the hope of the glory of the Lord, but he also says not only that, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings. What kind of crazy statement is that? What kind of crazy statement is it that says we are going to rejoice, we are going to be thankful. We are going to be thankful in a deep, guttural way that we get to suffer. Now the Bible sounds like it's talking crazy talk, right? It doesn't make any sense because the last thing most of us want to do, the last thing most of us want to do is go through hard times. The last thing most of us ever want to do is go through physical struggles and battles, the last thing that most of us ever want to do, and the, the things that scare us more than anything are those struggles. And I'm not here today to downplay those things. I'm not here today to downplay the, the scary words like cancer. I'm not here today to downplay those things at all. But the truth of the matter is, in this world, there are going to be struggles. There are going to be pains. And and in some ways, it, it's going to be worse if you are a follower of Jesus because the, the evil one's going to come and he's going to attack and he's going to try and hit us. Attacked for our faith. But Paul says, and this isn't the only place this has happened, this is James 1, 2, that we rejoice in our sufferings because something deep is happening. And I don't want to share what's, what, what's, what's happening here. I love this. This is, this is where it hits close to home for me. It says, we rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces endurance. Endurance is a fantastic word. I love this word. I had a PE coach in elementary school named Coach Saavedra. I wish I knew what his first name was, but Coach Saavedra was awesome because he taught me about cardiovascular endurance. The idea that when you run a little bit, your heart gets stronger and your muscles get stronger. And what happens the next time you run? You're a little stronger than you were before. And when you do that again, the next time you run, what happens? You're a little stronger than you were before. Now, I know most of us in this room, if you see most of us running, that probably means that there's something terrible happening back there. The only reason we're running is because something's about to kill us, right? This is just the reality. But, Paul's not talking about cardiovascular endurance right now. He's talking about spiritual endurance. 
one of the things that people have said, and I, I, I've probably said it, but I've heard a lot of people say this. Um, don't pray for patience because God's going to give you something that's going to make you learn patience. Is that bad? Is it bad to get stronger? Is it a bad thing to be stronger tomorrow than I am today? How many of you guys, if you could, would love to be able to wake up in the morning and bench press 350? <laughs> right? It'd be pretty fantastic. Or be able to wake up tomorrow morning and run a mile. Wouldn't it be cool to just to know I could do it? You're not going to wake up tomorrow and do it. Unless you start the process. You're not going to be able to wake up tomorrow and handle the terrible, terrible, terrible things that could come in this world unless you allow God to work the process today. Unless you allow God to work the process where the sufferings happen and you don't flee from them, you don't run away from them, you don't sit there and say, God, why are you doing this to me? Don't you realize I don't deserve this, God? And I'm saying this because these are the things that I have said in my own life, from my own words, in my own actions. I don't deserve this today. and I'm tired, God. I'm tired. Am I alone in that? But, Paul says that suffering produces endurance. That that suffering produces endurance and that, that, that endurance, so the NIV uses the word perseverance, it's the same word, that uh, it allows us to be able to go further. In fact, when we don't suffer, when we get everything that we want, that's usually when we're the biggest jerks. How many of you guys are probably more unhappy after a vacation than you were before? Anybody ever been there before? Because now I've got to go back to work. You had somebody interrupt you on your day off. Don't you realize this is my day? These are the things. When these things happen, God grows us. He says, suffering produces endurance, and I love this. Endurance produces character. That word character is a beautiful word. It's the word approvedness, which sounds weird, but it's the idea of something that has been through it and has made it. Something that you can trust because you know that it's been there before. Someone with character is somebody that you know you can trust. Someone with character is somebody who has integrity because you've seen it. A man who has character is a man that you can trust with your wallet or with your wife. A person with character is a person who has a deeper strength because they've been through it and they know it's not going to break them. That only happens when we rejoice in the sufferings because we have learned that we can endure. We, we have learned that God is good and that he is faithful and that if he's put me here, he's going to bring me through it. And when we have that type of character, we become people, and it doesn't matter, you don't have to be young and strong to be a person that people look at and say that they can trust. In fact, the people I trust oftentimes the most are the people who are older and a little less physically strong. There was a gentleman in the last church I was in named Eldon, and Eldon his back was bent over, so he'd talk like this. And he got to the place where he had a hard time being able to get sentences out in short, concise ways. And so Eldon would take 20 minutes to say what could have been said in 20 seconds sometimes because he would just keep wanting to, to explain and he would do these things and he would talk about all of these other things. But he would do that because Eldon knew there is so much that the people around don't understand. And if they understood this thing, they wouldn't have to be afraid anymore. I want to be that guy. Do you want to be that woman who is the, the type of woman that people, when they, when they see you, say, you know what? It's going to be okay because she showed up. Do you want to be that guy that people are like, you know what? Things seem like they're spinning out of control, but we can relax. Because he's here. 
That only happens when God has grown you and you have that approvedness, like you've made it through these things and you have a character that is different than the world around you. When we do that, an amazing thing happens. It says character produces hope. Hope is something that is very important Um, but it's different. Biblical hope is different than what we talk about when we talk about hope. When we talk about hope in our world today, we'll say words like, I sure hope I get rain today. I hope we get rain. Why are we saying that? Because we don't think we're going to get any rain. But we're hoping it gets a little better. Biblical hope is not that. When Paul said earlier, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of the Lord, that is a promised thing that is going to happen. Now, Paul says, we rejoice in our sufferings because our suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. When God has brought you through things, when God has shown you things, he has shown you his goodness, and now you have the assurance that he's going to do it again. I have that hope of the knowledge that he is going to do it again, and so I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be afraid. Biblical assurance Biblical biblical hope is assurance of what is coming. God is going to bring about an answer to this. God is going to bring about hope in the reason of why this is happening. The person that has been tested and made it through knows fully that the promises of God are true. That person has seen it. And that person has seen God's promises fulfilled. And that's the hope of the glory of the Lord. This is what Jesus has done for us. When the disciples were in their lowest place, when they saw Jesus crucified, when they, when they saw this, they didn't understand that Jesus kept saying, I'm going to die and I'm going to come back to life. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to die. I'm going to come back to life. And they kept saying, no, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. We're not even going to let that happen. And Jesus said, you have to let it happen. And then he did it. And after, after that point, they had this hope. Because if Jesus could die and come back to life, then all the rest of the stuff, all the rest of the promises are true. And that leads us to the last verse, Romans 5, 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. If you have this hope, you don't have to be ashamed. There's nothing that can shame you when you're living for Jesus. You're going to be weird. You're going to look different than the world around you. You're going to act different than the world around you, but you'll have no reason to be ashamed because the struggles that you're going through are guiding you to a place that you could not be without. And it's all proven by the Holy Spirit that God has placed in you because he loves you and his love is made complete in you. This is the beauty, right? And this is the difference that we get when we understand this. We understand that God is working in a beautiful way even when things are bad. I have a really good friend who um, got diagnosed with cancer here a few years ago and um, stage four and it didn't look like she was going to make it and God has brought her through. She is stronger today than she was then. But the hope of Jesus is this. Either way, there was going to be healing. I have been in places where I have been with people who died (laughs) with horrible battles and frustrations, but they died at peace because they knew that the healing was coming. I've watched as people have gone through horrible struggles in this world and God delivered them out of it and they were stronger for it. But that only happens when we know that God is good and that he is working. So my bottom line is this, guys. Faith in God is the only way to have hope in suffering. The truth of the matter is you're going to suffer. You're going to have hard times, but faith in God is is the way to have hope there. I had an opportunity here a few years ago um, to go with a group of EVCA students to to Italy. I got to go to to Rome. My wife and oldest daughter went along, and um, I got to go along with them. And uh, We went to the Colosseum. I got to see the Colosseum. This place is massive. We got to walk around this this giant stadium. 
right? It was built 2,000 years ago and, and see that. And it was really neat to see, but it was also really hard because the Colosseum is a place that they used to take Christians, brothers and sisters of mine, that I will get to see in eternity. They, will take, they used to take Christians there and for sport would have them killed. And it was bizarre being in there in some ways because I could not wrap my mind around the things that had happened right in the place I was looking at as people cheered. But those Christians, as that happened, didn't stop believing. And their family members didn't stop believing. And ultimately, the church continued to grow, even as this was happening, because what it did, what was happening is the church had an understanding that the suffering that I'm going through right now, this terrible suffering, is going to take me further than anything in this world could possibly take me. And it's going to be okay. Our God is good. He really is. And oftentimes we can get to the place where our eyes are distracted from that. The thing that makes most people walk away from listening to Jesus isn't the intellectual doubts. It's not the, uh, it's not the college classes that make them doubt and all these things. Really, most of the time, it's I don't understand why this suffering is happening to me or to somebody I know. But our God is faithful. And when we understand that, we can then ask him, God, why? In a powerful way. With your head, what I want to ask you to do is three things. Three things I want to ask you guys to do today, and we'll, we'll finish out here today. One, I want to ask you to memorize, with your head, memorize Romans 5, 3, and 4. Not only so, but we rejoice in the hope of the glory of the Lord. And then he says, not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings, for our suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and that hope does not disappoint us for his Holy Spirit God's love has been poured out through his Holy Spirit who he's given us. That God pours his Holy Spirit into us and we can rejoice in those things. Memorize that and then in your heart, have an honest conversation with God about your suffering. Have a real conversation with him. Don't be ashamed. Talk to him. God, what is your goal through this? To what end are you working in this? What is happening and why is this happening? But talk to him. And I mean like out loud. Like drive down the road looking crazy to the people on the road next to you. And talk to God. Don't just say you're going to do it. Do it. And then listen and trust him for the answer. And last, with your hands, I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you to rejoice. And this is something you have to physically do. You have to physically say, God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for this. Thank you for this struggle because you're good. I know that you know what you're doing and you're good. As we rejoice, as we rejoice, we get to see that the healing is going to happen. And there's something deeper that God does in us than anything that this world can give.